Right. So good evening and uh, welcome to the stream today as we continue with our examination journey this week. And uh, I believe that it's been great uh, for you in the previous papers yesterday and today for those of you who are writing. So today we're focusing on taxation in Ghana generally, and uh, we're looking at principles of taxation and uh, advanced taxation. So there is a, a line between the principles of taxation and advanced taxation, just a little thin line between the two, largely in that case. So we're going to be spending uh, some few minutes here to really go through some of the key principles and key issues that you need to really pay attention to as you head into the exam tomorrow. So we are live on YouTube as well. So for those of you who are joining us on YouTube, you're welcome. Put in the chat for me any questions you have for me relating to principles of taxation and advanced taxation. Then for those of you who are here with me on Zoom, you can raise your hand and bring you up or you put it in the chat for me. Any specific question that you have for me or something you would want me to throw a light on or share some thoughts on when it comes to principles of taxation and advanced taxation. Then I'm also going to be trying to walk you through a couple of the principles that you have to be mindful of to be able to position yourself to ultimately pass your examination at the end of the day when it comes to the principles of taxation and the advanced taxation. So that is the deal for the session tonight. If you have any specific questions, you raise your hand, I bring you up or you put it in the chat for me. Those of you are watching us on YouTube also, the same thing like that. Now, so when it comes to principles of taxation and advanced taxation, there are some similarities and a couple of things that cut across generally. One of the things that is going to be fundamental in the examination, whether in the principles of taxation or advanced taxation, is the issue about corporate tax liabilities. There's a 20 mark in the exam hall waiting for you in relation to corporate tax liabilities that you need to understand. But corporate tax liabilities, it's a topic because we are determining the tax liabilities for a company. But before we determine the chargeable income of a company and ultimately determine the tax payable for the company, there are a couple of principles that we need to really be mindful of and position ourselves in to be able to pass the examination. Not only that, all the principles under all the principles under corporate tax liabilities are also separately examinable for between five, seven, three, two marks in the exam hall, both at the advanced taxation level and the principles of taxation level. So it's a crucial area and there are a number of principles that we need to understand there well to position ourselves to pass the examination. The first thing we need to understand when it comes to dealing with corporate tax liabilities is most importantly to be mindful of the company that is in the question. When we say be mindful of the company in the question, it, it's because we want to be mindful of the tax rates that we have to use generally at the end of the day. Because traditional companies will pay tax at a rate of 25%. So any traditional company will be subject to the payment of tax at 25%. However, if we are dealing with a manufacturing company, then its location is going to be coming in because the manufacturing companies are going to be enjoying what we refer to as the location incentive. So for instance, if we have a, a question and we are dealing with a manufacturing company, and this is also in line with standard tax planning measures for the advanced taxation students. So you got to be mindful of this as we walk through some of these principles again. So if we have a manufacturing company that is located in Accra and Tema, then the tax payable is going to be the standard tax rate of 25%. But if we have a manufacturing company that is located in outside the uh, great Accra and Tema in the regional capitals, they're going to be enjoying a tax rebate of 25%, thereby paying a corporate tax of 18.75%. However, if the manufacturing companies are located outside the regional capital, they are going to be subject to a payment of tax at a rate of 12.5% because they enjoy a 50% tax rebate on the corporate tax rate of 25%. So it is mindful that we understand that if we are dealing with the companies that are into manufacturing, 
we are mindful of the location because that will inform the rates that we are going to be using. The same thing happens to agro-processing companies. That is companies that are going to be using uh, byproducts from the agricultural sector to further process their products. They also have the tax rates that are applicable to them that we have to be mindful of. So the issue about corporate tax liabilities, the first thing we need to be mindful of is what type of organization are we dealing with? Where is the organization located? If in the given question, the examiner is really careful or mindful of giving you this information, then you have to also be particular about the kind of tax rate that you're going to be using in arriving at the figure at the end of the day. So that's the first thing, the corporate tax rate. The second thing that is going to be crucial for us is the issue about capital allowance. It depends on how excited the examiner is. He could ask you to work for a 10 marks on capital allowance schedule, or he would just embed it in the 20 mark question for corporate tax liabilities for you to provide an answer. However, whether you are having it as in embedded in the question or as a dedicated term or question, there are a couple of principles that you need to understand. For traditional companies, that is companies operating outside the petroleum and mining sector, they are going to be using the pooling system for treatment of capital allowance. For that reason, all depreciable assets used in the generation of the income of the company will be qualifying for capital allowance. Note, capital allowance can only be granted when the entity is using the asset in the generation of income against which capital allowance is sought. This is very crucial. The reason is that if the entity owns the property, controls the property, but has lent, uh, has rented out a portion of the property to third parties to receive rental income, then that portion that has been rented out to receive rental income, the entity cannot claim capital allowance on that portion of the property. So it is important you understand that we can only claim capital allowance on assets that we are using in the generation of the income against which we are claiming the capital allowance. However, like I said, for traditional companies, they're going to be applying the polling system. What does that mean? It means that assets are going to be classified from pool one to pool five or from class one to class five. The deal is pretty simple. Assets in class one to class five lose their identity. What does that mean? It means that if during the year there is a new asset that is bought, that is there is an additional asset bought from class one to class three, we just add it to the written down value brought forward and get the, re the restated amount, then the capital allowance for that year is calculated. Very sweet, simple, straight to the point because class one to class three assets lose their identity. Two. Class one to class three assets are also depreciated on the reducing balance basis. What does that mean? It means that the capital allowance to be calculated for a given year of assessment will have to be based on the rated down value brought forward or the restated balance after adding any addition for the period under review. So number one, class one to class three assets lose their identity. Any addition during the year is added to the written down value brought forward to get a restated amount and capital allowance is calculated on that restated amount. Two, assets in class one to class three are going to be, uh, capital allowance will be granted on a reducing balance basis. Capital allowance will be granted on a reducing balance basis. That's the second thing that we need to understand. Third, any disposal, from any of the classes, that's class one to class three assets, would during the year would just be subtracted from the written down value brought forward and the restated amount, capital allowance shall be granted on it. However, where the entire pool is depreciated, sorry, however, when the entire pool is disposed of, then there is nothing left. In that case, any proceeds, in excess of the written down value brought forward of the pool will be added to the chargeable income of the entity and tax at the corporate tax rate of 25%. Because companies are not required to file 
capital gain tax separately, they are supposed to add any gain on disposal of a pool of assets to their chargeable income and tax at the corporate tax rate. However, where the proceeds from the disposal of the entire pool is less than the written down value brought forward of the pool, the loss on the disposal of the pool shall be given as an allowable deduction for the year under review. That is the idea about class one to class three assets. Class four and five assets are usually going to be, especially class four assets, will be assets of feminine structure, like office building, factory, warehouse, signboard. Those are things of permanent structure. These assets do not lose their identity. Class five are intangible assets. Please note, goodwill is not a depreciable asset. As such, capital allowance is not granted on goodwill. Yes, for accounting purposes, IAS 36 suggests that we test for impairment for goodwill. So that's an accounting class. But in the tax environment, goodwill is not a depreciable asset. And since goodwill is not a depreciable asset, capital allowance is not granted on goodwill. So the kind of intangible assets that are recorded in the class five will include issues like trademark, copyright, patents, those kind of assets whose recoverable amounts can reliably be measured generally at the end of the day, or whose acquisition resulted into the company incurring some expenditure at the end of the day. But the key thing there is that class four and class five assets do not lose their identity. Hence, any addition will be put in a separate pool of its own and capital allowance will be granted. What does that mean? It means that if we are in 2022, but the balance written down brought forward in the class four, there is a building there. Then in 2022, the entity acquired or constructed another building. You don't go and add the new building to the existing building. No, you just have to have 4A and then 4B because class four and five assets do not lose their identity. Also, capital allowance is granted on the class four and five assets on a straight line basis. I hope I'm not rushing, right? Let me know if you think I'm rushing because you know this is a solid revision for you tomorrow. So let me know if my pace is right. In the chat or uh, you can indicate to me so that I know I'm reasonably, you are reasonably flowing with me. So that is the idea about the capital allowance issue. But if this is the first time the entity commence trading and we are dealing with capital allowance in the first year of trading of the company then capital allowance shall be granted based on the number of days that is very important based on the number of days so if the company started trading in 2021 and we are calculating capital allowance for 2022 you know you cannot jump from 2021 and go to 2022 you need to calculate the written down value brought down for 2021 and bring that as brought forward in 2022. So when we are calculating the capital allowance for that first year of commencing of business, the capital allowance to be calculated shall be based on the number of days from the commencement date till the year ended of the entity or from the date that the asset was acquired till the year ended of the entity. So be mindful of that particular aspect. And we deal with number of days. You cannot use month. And you lent a song in KG to 30 days of September, April, June, and November. All the rest of 31 is February alone, which has da 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 da. So, like that song, make sure it's in your head. If you see a capital allowance question like that, you know it very well. Because if you mix the number of days, technically you're going to miss all the calculation. You're going to get zero for it. Because you see, if a capital allowance is supposed to be 9041, but you use a wrong number of days and you end up getting 9134, you are wrong. Now, if you are wrong from the beginning, you're going to be wrong for the rest. So be mindful of that if the company started a business and we are calculating the capital allowance for the first year of assessment into the second year of assessment. Take note, 
either we're going to be using the date of acquisition of the assets up to the first end of the first year ended, and or we are going to be dealing with the issue about when the company commences trading at the end of the day. And that is the idea generally about capital allowance. But there is a last thing. In the question, when we have things like repairs and improvements, please note, not always will the language be repairs and improvements. So you got to use your head very well. Let me explain what I'm saying. If the line is just repairs, repairs are allowable deductions, so we're not going to touch it. However, if we see repairs and improvement, or you see that the entity buys a new engine to replace an existing engine, that is also classified as repairs and improvements. What is the rule? The rule about repairs and improvements or acquisition of replacement uh, expenditure is that the amount to be allowable for tax purposes shall not exceed 5% of the written down value of the assets. What does that mean? Let's say that we bought a motor vehicle and it's being classified as a class two asset. Then we bought an, an engine, a replacement engine during the year. Okay, the total cost of the engine will not be allowable for tax purposes. The amount to be allowable will be 5% of the written down value of the asset. So what we do is that we're going to pick that class and pretend to do capital allowance for that year and debt to get a written down value closing. Then we can calculate 5% of that written down value and compare that with the capital expenditure incurred in the repairs and improvements or the engine replacement. If the amount we incurred is greater than 5% of the written down value, the excess is disallowed. So we add it back to the profit of the company and you go and add it back to the capital allowance schedule for that class of assets that you are dealing with. So that is the principle generally about how we deal with capital allowance and repairs and improvement. That is the issue that you must understand when we talk about capital allowance, which is one of the fundamental issues that will come in the determination of corporate tax liabilities, either as a dedicated question or embedded in the question. But when we come to the non-traditional companies, that is petroleum and mining operations, we're not going to be using the pooling system. The, the rule is pretty simple. For petroleum and mining companies, what will happen is that all capital expenditures are put in a single pool and capital allowance is going to be granted at 20% straight line or over a period of five years. If you remember, in mining, there are three stages to go. We have what we call reconnaissance, uh, exploration and then development, sorry, es reconnaissance, exploration and mining. Then in petroleum, we have exploration, development and uh, production. What is happening here is that in a mining environment, exploration and, uh, sorry, reconnaissance and exploration, all costs incurred during these stages will be put into a single pool. And then when mining begins, capital allowance will be granted on a straight line method over five years or at 20%. The same thing happens to petroleum and mining corporations. It's going to be exploration development. All the costs incurred at these stages will be capitalized. And then when production begins, capital allowance will be granted on a straight line method or on a straight line method over five years or at 20% straight line at the end of the day. So that is the deal with the way we handle capital allowance generally in the petroleum and mining operations as well in that case. Any questions in respect of that? For those of you on Zoom with me, you raise your hand and bring you up or you put it in the chat for me. Then for those of you on YouTube also, I'm monitoring your comments here. I'll be able to provide you with some answers. Yes, Stephen. You sure? Yes. Hello. Hello. Yeah, so um, 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 I'm saying this in respect to um, when you are being asked to calculate the capital allowance and then subsequently you will be calculating or computing uh, the chargeable income. That means um, the, the capital allowance you um, as a pain will be um, deducted from uh, the adjusted, adjusted profit. profit. So 
in case we um, um, we have two years, like we are working for two years, say 2016, 2017, are you going to pick um, the capital allowance for the 2017 alone or you add them up and then no. carry the... It's just what relates to the year under review that we are going to be bringing in that year under review. Whatever, it's like sure. what you know in FR and PSA, whatever. Um, we don't bring any previous year issue in the current year. It's only the current year issue that will be dealt with as an assessment. So, for instance, um, I calculated the capital allowance in 2016 and had 22970. 2, 2, and um, in 2017, I had 1258. Zero. Now together I will be getting like um close to four hundred thousand. You don't need to put it together because so you are just I'm, going that to, means deal I'm with not it. going to uh, that the twenty seventeen aspect of the capital allowance. No, 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 no. There is no rationale for that. So it's only the current year issue that you have to deal with. I'm a bit confused first. Um, that is that exactly. is what you need to understand about dealing with capital allowance. If you are calculating capital, you are preparing the year ended 20x7, and you are the business started in 20x6, you are preparing the yeah. year ended 20x7. That is the year ended capital allowance that you're going to be uh, bringing in. We're going to be subtracting because it is that year's depreciation that we are going to be adding back to the profit of the company. So it is that year's capital allowance that will be given as an allowance. That's the deal about how you deal with capital allowance. You don't bring any previous year figure back into the deal. What's it a network? Okay, sorry, maybe you can check yourself up and then come back. You say you didn't hear me well. Okay, what I'm saying is that if you are in 20X7, you bring capital allowance for 20X7. What you did in 20X6 would have been written off against 20X6 tax issue already. It has nothing to do with the current year. So we're not going to be, we're not going to be bringing it in the 20X7 issue. So that is the idea about that. So that's the first you know, item about corporate tax liabilities, capital allowance, and its brother, research and development. Another thing that is going to be standing out in dealing with corporate tax liabilities generally is going to be the issue of financial cost and financial gain. Now, you've got to be mindful of this because the financial cost and financial gain arises as a result of the entity entering into derivative financial instruments transactions like currency features, like uh, forward contracts and all of those things. When the entity enters into any of these transactions, the cost they incur becomes the financial cost. The gain or the benefits they derive becomes the financial gain generally at the end of the day. But how do we treat these things? Treatment of these things would depend on whether the company is a traditional company or is a company operating in the mining and oil exploration. So for all traditional companies, the principle is simple. The financial cost allowable for tax purposes shall be the financial gain plus 50% of the adjusted chargeable income. What does that mean? It means for us to know the financial cost that will be allowable for tax purposes, we need to readjust the profits of the company, adding back things that are not to be allowed, and then subtracting things that are to be allowed. Then the financial cost was deducted in arriving at the profit of the company. So we're going to add it back. Then the financial gain was added in arriving at their net profit. So we subtract it. So we're going to prepare a schedule for the adjusted chargeable income and 50% of that plus the financial gain becomes the financial cost that, are going, that is going to be allowable for tax purposes. Any financial costs in excess of the allowable shall be carried over for five years. Why? Because financial costs are not allowed on a wholesale basis, but they are going to be allowed over a period of five years. And that is the deal about financial costs and financial gain treatment by traditional companies or default companies. On the other hand, when it comes to the mining and petroleum, that is for level three students, advanced taxation, 
we are going to be using what we refer to as the matching principle. What the heck is that? The matching principle simply states that the financial cost allowable shall be equal to the financial gain and during the year. So for the mining petroleum mineral companies, any, any in a year of assessment, when there is a financial cost and no financial gain, the financial cost incurred for the year will be carried over for a period of five years. Okay? But then in a year where they make a gain without a financial cost, the gain will be added to their chargeable income and tax at their corporate tax rate of 35%. So that is also the deal about how we deal with financial cost and financial gain in that particular case. And that is what we must understand when we talk about dealing with financial cost and financial gain as well, both in the default company and then also in the mining and petroleum companies. Then still under the corporate tax liability issues, one of the things that will come up is interest expenses. Now, when a company borrows money, now there is, there is an exception that I'm going to be throwing out here. So make sure you get me carefully on this one. When a company borrows money by default from a resident company to another resident company, all the interest that they pay will be subject to, will be allowable for tax purposes. That's all. However, when the company borrows money from a foreign company or from a foreign entity, or now this is the uh, other aspect of that, or they borrow the money from a resident company. However, that resident company has more than 50% ownership of them, then fin capitalization rule will apply. Let me take that again. When an entity borrows money from one resident entity to another resident entity, the interest expenses payable is allowable for tax purposes. Or, however, when a resident entity borrows money from a non-resident entity, a foreign entity, or borrows money from a resident entity that has more than 50% ownership in the company borrowing the money, then not all the interest expenses and any foreign exchange loss as a result of the capital repayment will be allowable for tax purposes. So the thin capitalization principle then would step in, which states that the debt allowable for tax purposes shall not exceed three times the equity of the entity. What does that mean? The equity of the entity in this case is the share capital or the stated capital plus the income surplus or what we refer to as retained earnings. That's all. That's all. So when we add the stated capital of the entity to the income surplus or retained earnings, that gives us the equity of the entity. And that times three will give us the debt allowable. Where the debt allowable is more than the debt of the company, then all interest expenses, all uh, foreign exchange losses will be allowable for tax purposes. So we don't do anything. However, where the debt allowable is less than the debt outstanding, always note it is the debt outstanding and capital at the beginning of the year is less than it, then we are going to be doing the calculation to do the finance or the interest expenses that will be allowable for tax purposes and the foreign exchange loss that will be allowable for tax purposes. Note, in interest expenses and foreign exchange losses, once it is disallowed, we add it back to the profit of the entity and it's lost. So that is not going to be carry over like financial cost will be carry over. So once they lose it this year, it is lost because it's one time and one time only. That is the idea about a thin capitalization concept and how it is going to be treated generally. So it comes in when a resident entity is borrowing money from a non-resident entity or a resident entity is borrowing money from another resident entity where the lender has more than 50% of the voting rights in the entity to whom they are lending the money. 
then thin capitalization will come in for us to determine how much of the interest expenses and or any foreign exchange loss arising as a result of repayment will be allowable for tax purposes. That is what we must understand about the treatment of interest expenses. Please don't get that twisted with finance cost. I know that by default in your accounting and corporate reporting class, finance cost is finance cost. But here, the financial cost we are talking about, like I said earlier, is arising from derivative financial instruments. And the interest expenses we are talking about here, it's about borrowing money and the interest that we are paying at the end of the day. And that is what you must understand when we talk about the thin capitalization concept as well and how it is dealt with. So we've spoken about capital allowance. We've discussed research and development. We've spoken about financial cost and financial gain. We've discussed the issue about the thin capitalization concept and how it steps in. Then there are other issues that we need to understand about other income. Companies are going to be receiving other forms of income, and they may or may not require to pay tax on them, depending on the type of income in question. Number one, company is going to be receiving, say, rental income. If they rent out a portion of their facility to another entity and receive any rental income, because it will be treated as an investment income, the law is that that investment income will be subject to a final withholding tax of 7.5%. Now, if it is a final withholding tax, it means that rental income should no longer be included in the determination of the chargeable income of the entity. That's all. That's all. So any rental income is subject to a final withholding tax and it ends there in that case. However, if the entity receives interest on some investment that they have made, remember, interest paid to individuals are exempted from tax, but when the interest is paid to companies, it is subject to a withholding tax on account. What does that mean? It means that in the beginning, we're going to be lessing the net amount that the company included in the determination of their profit. Then after we get the adjusted profit, we'll bring other income. Then the gross amount will be brought in the other income. Then we calculate the corporate tax of the company. Once we calculate the corporate tax of the company, any tax withheld by the payee financial institution will be given as a relief to be able to then determine the net tax payable by the company. And that is the idea about interest. Then there is also dividends. The entity may also receive dividend and dividend will generally be subject as well to the withholding tax on account at the end of the day, especially if the dividend is also coming from the foreign country. We're going to be grossing it up. Again, the net amount to be deducted first. We gross it up and bring the gross amount and the other income. Corporate tax is going to be calculated. And once we get a corporate tax, we are going to then... Uh, less whatever tax that has been withheld, either from the country that the dividend is coming from, uh, the dividend was coming from, where Ghana has a double tax arrangement with that country, then boom, we're going to get a net tax payable as well in that case. So those are other income and how we need to deal with them generally in that regard, dividend, interest, and then also the issue about rental income. And so those are some of the things also that could be thrown in, in the determination of the chargeable income of the company. Then the general rules about what is allowable and what is unallowable. Remember, for interest to be, for any expenses to be allowable, it must be wholly, exclusively, and necessarily incurred by the entity. So things like donations, donations to political parties, donations to any unworthy cause, donations that are not recognized by the Ghana Revenue Authority would definitely be disallowed for tax purposes at the end of the day. Then any payments the entity makes in line with a uh, breach of law. So for instance, we are paying, the entity paid fines because when the Food and Drug Authority came around or Ghana Standard Authority came around, their facility was not to the standard, hence they have to pay some fines. That fine will not be allowable for tax purposes, so we disallow it. Remember, anything, any item you pick that is disallowed, you have to go and add it back to the profit of the company. 
if it is allowable, you don't do anything to it. You just leave it because it's, they have already done the right thing. So you don't do anything to it. It is only when the item is not allowable that will require an addition back to the profits of the company in order for you to arrive at the chargeable income of the company. So that is also the things that we need to understand. Then any domestic expenditures also will definitely be disallowed for tax purposes because they could be generally considered as not holy exclusively and necessarily incurred by the entity. Then the last one that I would bring to your notice is the concept of transfer pricing. And this is exclusively for the advanced taxation students because when transactions don't occur at arm's length, even though it could be in principles of tax as well, so just pay attention. If transactions are not at arm's length, remember the arm's length price is the price at which transactions are carried out between unrelated parties. The, the arm's length price is the price at which transactions are carried out between unrelated or independent parties. Transactions between related parties, that is a parent and subsidiary or partners of business must be carried at arm's length. What does that mean? It means that they must be carried as though they are independent parties. So any transaction at all, it could be sales, it could be cost item, whatever the heck it is, that was not carried at arm's length. For tax purposes, we must bring it back and carry it at arm's length. And that may require an incremental addition, an incremental subtraction, or whatever the heck it is. You have to just understand that transaction between related parties must always be undertaken at arm's length and we use the arm's length price, not the price at which they charge themselves whilst they were trading because the GRA will come in and rewrite those transactions. So that is also something that we need to understand when we are dealing with the corporate tax liabilities. Then, you know, bad debt, usually bad debt could be allowable for tax purposes if the entity can prove that they have made all efforts to recover the funds, but the efforts have been unfruitful, then the bad debt will be allowable for tax purposes. Same happens or applies to provision for bad debt. Generally, um, provision for general bad debt will not be allowable for tax purposes because who the heck or what the heck, like general bad debt, what's that? But if it is provision for bad debt and it is in relation to specific bad debt, the assumption is that the GRA might have been informed already about the deal. Hence, that will be allowable for tax purposes in that case. So these are some of the things that we need to understand generally when it comes to the corporate tax liabilities issue. Like I said, all of these principles that I've mentioned can be a dedicated three marks, five marks, two marks, seven marks that the examiner could throw in and you're going to be writing English in respect of that in the exam hall. So you have to be mindful of to be able to deal with that. Then note that when we are solving the question, you have to deal with the issue about um, notes because you see, you don't just get up and say, oh, I'm adding, I'm subtracting, I'm disallowing, I'm allowing. No, you have to write some notes down to justify what the heck you've done. Now, Definitely, you cannot write the note for all of the workings that you're doing because you don't have a lot of time available. But, you know, take some time to write about three to five of the controversial issues in the question because some things are just going to be blank. For instance, legal fees. Okay, so you see a transaction like or an item, expenditure item like legal fees. What the heck? Legal fees. It's not clear. Is it legal fee because the entity breached the law or it's legal fee for the day-to-day -day running of the company? Whatever assumption that you're going to use, you have to write it down, okay? So not everything you have to write down, but things that are a little bit controversial, like the company has made a donation to whom? To the, yeah, the company made a donation to the CFO's mother's funeral. So at the CFO's mother's funeral, the company made a donation. Who cares about that? She can die. We don't care. GRA doesn't care. So that item will be disallowed for tax purposes. Now, somebody will say, oh, is it not a form of advertisement? No, 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 no. What does it do to the company? Nothing. So 
if you're going to disallow it, then you have to state down the reason behind your disallowance. So the deal here is that, yes, you cannot write for everything, but take time to write for three to five of the items because the examiner would then know that, yeah, you go. It's not that you're just copying and bringing some things up. Does it mean if you don't write any notes, the examiner is going to punish you? Yes, the examiner is going to punish you because you don't just prepare a tax assessment without any notes explaining what the heck has been done. That's the deal there when it comes to dealing with the corporate tax liabilities. And remember to write the name of the company, what the heck you are calculating, and the basis period. Very, very important. That is going to be the starting point when the examiner is trying to mark your answers out. Then the last thing, I don't know, I've said the last thing about corporate tax liabilities like four times already. But another thing that we need to understand about corporate tax liabilities is the treatment of losses. You know, we mentioned that by default, companies operating in the priority sector can carry over losses for five years. Any company outside the priority sector can carry over losses for three years. So what are some of the companies in the priority sectors? Okay, agro-processing, waste processing, ICT education, you know, those kind of things, they can carry over losses indefinitely at the end of the day. And sorry, for five years, not indefinitely, for five years, because they are in the priority sector, agro-processing, manufacturing companies, ICT, waste processing, those kind of companies can carry over losses for five years because they are priority sectors. Note, mining and oil exploration companies are also in the priority sector and they can carry over losses for five years. However, depending on their petroleum agreement with the government, they could carry over losses indefinitely. So that is the exceptional part for the companies operating in the petroleum and mining sector. But all other companies can carry over losses for three years. But you see, when you're dealing with losses, there are two types of losses, and you have to be mindful of the way the losses are to be treated. What do we mean? So we have what we refer to as business loss and investment loss. What is that? The name is in it. Business losses, losses that is coming from the traditional operations of the company. And that loss can be carried over for three years, if it's not a priority company, or five years, if it is a priority company. Then we have investment loss. The investment loss are losses that are coming in. Investment losses are losses that are coming in from various investment that a company makes. This is the deal. Investment loss can only be written off against investment income. However, Business loss can be written off against investment income. Let me take that again. There is investment loss. There is business loss. Losses from your investment can only be written off against income from your investment. However, losses from your business can be written off against business income as well as income from your investment. The rationale is pretty simple. You cannot go and make some dumb investment, lose money, and you come and write that loss against your day-to-day -day core activities of the company. Then the government will not get anything because of your stupid investment. So that is why losses from investment cannot be written off against business income. But... If you make some losses in your business, because this is what you are into, that loss can be written off against any investment income or gain you had from the investment. And that is the distinction between the treatment of investment income and business income. And that's the idea about that. So I don't know. I think I've touched on everything about corporate tax liabilities, I guess. As per my brain can, you know, remember, which is a little bit good in that case. If there are any questions about corporate tax liabilities and the principles that and all of those things that I've mentioned, you could put it in the chat for me or raise your hand and I'll bring you up in that case. Let's see. 
Albert Einstein said, based on his personal capital allowance question, what of the situation where the company commenced business late in the year and is now preparing the first chargeable income for the next year of assessment? I don't understand. We have to treat everything differently. So let's say the year ended of the company is 31st December. They started business in October, right? So we are preparing the financial statement for what? We are preparing assessment for the year ended 31st December of the next year. So they started business in October 20X5. And we are calculating the tax for the December 20X6. It depends on the context of the question. If they are preparing the assessment for the entire period from the date of the commencement to the current year of assessment, then the total capital allowance will be brought. But if we are doing separate assessment for the year ended, then we have to bring separate assessment of the capital allowance as well in the treatment. So it depends on the context of the question. You cannot do an assessment for 12 months, January to December 20X6, that is the assessment for that year, and bring the capital allowance relating to October to December 20X5 in that mix. No, it cannot happen. Because if you started a business in October to December, you might have made some income and hence you would have claimed some capital allowance in that respect. If you made a loss, then that loss could be written off against the 20X6 uh, chargeable income that we are going to be getting so we can assess the tax payable at the end of the day. So Albert, let me know if that makes sense. All right. Please kindly go over capital allowance treatment. My internet went off. Oh, Ernestina, Mr. We party. Mean to mean, yes, I'll be let me know if there is something specific because I spoke about a lot of things under capital allowance generally and wouldn't be able to go through all of them again. Let me see some questions on YouTube quickly. Um, Koyi said, thanks so much, Inshira. I passed my financial reporting paper by going through your lectures on here. God bless you. Looking forward to lectures on corporate reporting. Okay, that's great. Eunice, Aluma too said, please, I want to know more about petroleum tax, the allowance and non-allowable cost. I'm going to come there in a moment. So you need to stay with me. Former said, hello, Shira, please. Can I get the Zoom meeting details to join via Zoom? Unfortunately, that is for our students who are joining us on the live call. So maybe you would want to enroll in our courses next semester and be part of the community here, uh, live on Zoom with us, with our live lectures. Daniel Arthur said, good job, sir. Jelomi said, you are on track. Okay. Edith said, please, does it include written down value? I don't get a contest of that, Edith. Maybe give me something. How is capital work in progress treated in relation to capital allowance? Work in progress, you cannot claim capital allowance on it because it's not done yet. So it's just going to be a separate item on its own. We're going to disallow it for tax purposes, but it's just going to be a separate item on its own because you are not using it yet. Remember the key issue about granting of capital allowance is when the asset is being used in the generation of the income against which the capital allowance is claimed. So if it is a work in progress, it's a capital item, we disallow it for tax purposes, but it will be in its own pool. But since the entity hasn't started using it, we cannot claim any capital allowance on it. So capital work in progress, no capital allowance is granted, but it will be disallowed for tax purposes because it's a capital item. Please, was lost on the research and development issue? I don't understand. Can you please explain treatment of consultancy fees? Consultancy fees are allowable expenses based on the rationale that it's a cost that the entity will incur, maybe in the day-to-day -day running of the company. So it could be allowed for tax purposes and you have to state the rationale for the allowance or otherwise of that. Bismarck said, please, what does relief loss mean? I think I've already mentioned the issue about relief loss. These are losses that have not yet been written off against the income of the company. 
okay uh losses that have not yet been uh written off against the company the profits of the company and those are losses that are going to be carry over into the future jelomi said can you please take us through the method of methods of transfer pricing i don't know if time will allow me to teach that if there's something specific you can bring it up because i may not be able to go through everything also the treatment of class five and class four as class five and four assets i think i've already done that under the capital allowance please will it be available to watch later yes the video will be available on youtube to be able to watch later after the stream okay so that's corporate tax liabilities and it's all entourage of staffs that we need to understand but there are other issues that we need to also be mindful of so i'm going to be switching GA a little bit to the corporate reporting and uh, sorry the advanced taxation environment a little bit then i'm going to come back to the two things that are in both principles and advanced so stay with me still if you're doing principles of taxation but i'm going to make some uh brief uh, i'm going to make a brief explanation on advanced taxation issues a little bit but still say, stay with me if you are doing principles of taxation in the advanced taxation level one of the key issues that will stand out for us is dealing with the issue about standard tax planning measures generally at the end of the day so it is important we understand the various issues about the standard tax planning measures like the maxims of tax planning the activity you know the uh characteristics uh, variable it's also that the location variable is also that we must understand all of these things in that particular case but then there is also what we refer to as the anti-avoidance okay the anti-avoidance are the provisions and the various things that are available which prevents entities from the effective planning of their taxes so we have what we call the judiciary constraints and these are where the, there are judgments that has been given by the law, which then guides the commissioner general to rewrite transactions. So for instance, there is issue about substance over form where all transactions are not taken under arm's length. The commissioner general can come in and rewrite those transactions. So for instance, let's say that I go to Melcom and Melcom is whatever, undertaking a promotion and I go there and they are selling this bottle of water for maybe the pack of the water to be, let's say, 10 cities. Okay. It's not a spot. Everything is work, working well. 10 cities per pack. But usually that could have sold for, say, 17 cities. But because of the promotion, they are selling it at 10 cities. Then I buy 100 packs. 100 packs. Then I leave. Then someone also comes. Let's say, Another person, whoever, let's call the person Juliet. Juliet also goes there, sees the same promotion, but bought five packs. The question we ask ourselves is, between myself and Juliet, who has a business agenda in mind? I bought 100 packs. What the heck am I going to use 100 packs of water for? Juliet bought only five. Now, it's a debatable environment, but that is the way the law is. The assumption is that I bought 100 packs because I'm going to sell it and make some money. So there is a business motive behind what I bought. And so my transaction will be dealt with as a business transaction. And the GRA can come after me and rewrite the transaction, especially if they smell that I really went and sold it. So that whatever profit I make will be subject to tax. But GRA will not be bothered about Juliet. Who bought only five because she bought five she was going to drink five packs of water in a week that's fair but 100 packs what the heck in shira even if you're going to marry you're going to do uh parties or have a party or whatever it is it's not reasonable at the end of the day so that is the concept of judiciary constraints that's an example of that when the gra smells something like that there are judicial precedents that allows the Commissioner General to come and rewrite the transaction and restate the purpose of the business and the tax that is applicable is going to be applying at the end of the day. Then we have issues about uncertainty as well as a constraint. The reason is that, you know, you are planning your taxes because you know that when you do A, B, and C, 
this will happen. But sometimes what you plan for does not happen at the end of the day. And so that is also going to be there. Then we have what we call the provisional constraints, which are the things that are included in the Income Tax Act 2015, Act 896 as amended, which prevents the effective planning of tax. For instance, thin capitalization. The law says if you borrow money, all should be the interest you pay should be allowable for tax purposes. Yes, that is the law. But in that same law, there is an exception that states that if you are borrowing the money from a foreign lender or you are borrowing the money from another entity, resident entity, that has uh, more than 50% of the voting rights of your company, then not all the interest and any foreign exchange laws will be allowable for tax purposes. It's in the law. So it limits effective planning of taxes so that you are borrowing the money though and the law by default says the interest should be allowable for tax purposes. But because of that, say, in that same law, there is an exception. Hence, that exception prevents you from the effective planning of taxes at the end of the day. Another limitation is the issue still in the law is the concept of income splitting. Companies can decide to split their income between related parties and all that. But if the GRS smells foul play and smells the misapplication of the transfer pricing rule, the GRA can come in and rewrite it because, like I said earlier, transaction between related parties must be undertaken at arm's length, and we must use the arm's length price in determining the transactions that are occurring between related parties. So in the law, it's there that when GRA smells anything like that, it's going to come after you. And so these are what we call the anti-avoidance, the things which are there that prevents effective planning of taxes. Then another issue is going to be the international implication of taxes. That is the concept of double taxation. And so you must understand some of the countries, know some of the countries that Ghana has the double taxation arrangement with. For instance, we're talking about Mauritius, we're talking about Germany, we're talking about UK, talking about the USA, we're talking about Nigeria, you know, our old boys at Nigeria. So know some of the countries, you know, just off head there. But the main thing is also to understand the functions of the transfer, uh, sorry, to, to know the objectives of double taxation and the reasons for double taxation. You can scan and read those things. I will not be able to you know, share thoughts on everything book for book. But then generally there are gonna be two methods for granting of uh, foreign tax credits on double taxation at the end of the day. We have what we call the relinquish approach. This is usually for entities where the entity elects to relinquish the tax that has been paid in the foreign country. What the heck does that mean? It means that when we take the global income of the company, whatever tax that has been paid in the country where Ghana has a double taxation arrangement with, that tax will be as an allowable deduction before we calculate the corporate tax of the entity at the end of the day. So that is the elect to relinquish method. And the question will be categorical that the company has elect to relinquish, then you apply that rule. So that whatever tax that is paid in a foreign country will be treated as an allowable deduction here in Ghana before we calculate the tax payable by the entity at the end of the day. But for individuals, generally, we're going to be using the effective tax rate approach. What does that mean? It means that we'll calculate the effective tax rate in the foreign country where the money came from, and that is going to be the tax paid in that foreign country divided by the gross income in the foreign country. That's it. Times 100, that gives us the effective rate in the foreign country. Then you come and calculate the effective rate in Ghana. The effective rate in Ghana is also going to be the tax payable divided by the chargeable income in Ghana. So when you're dealing with the chargeable income of the individual in Ghana, you must include the gross income the gross foreign income in it. You must include the gross foreign income in the calculation. That is very important at the end of the day. Then you use the individual graduated tax rate. If the examiner wants to talk about individuals, he's going to be bringing you the graduated tax schedule. You calculate the tax payable 
that divided by your chargeable income times 100 gives you the effective rate in Ghana. What I want you to take away from that discussion is simple. We compare the effective tax rate in the foreign country to the effective tax rate in Ghana. The foreign tax credit to be granted will be at which rate that is lower, based on the lower rate. So if Ghana's rate is 25 and the foreign effective rate is 15, then you get a foreign tax credit based on the 15 multiplied by the gross foreign income ever, period. That's all I want you to think about. If Ghana's tax rate is 15, the foreign tax rate is 30. The foreign tax credit going to be granted will be the Ghana's tax rate 15 multiplied by the gross foreign income. And that will be deducted from your tax liability, which you have already computed. Then you'll be able to get a net tax payable by the individual. So that is also the concept about double taxation and what you do generally in relation to that as well. Please, is allowable repairs and improvement 5% on reading down at the beginning or is on the reading down at the end of the year of assessment? Okay, I addressed this, but it's at the year because the concept is that if there is repairs and improvement, you are going to be calculating the capital allowance for that year and get the written down value at the end of the year. So it's always 5% of the written down value at the end of the year. So you're going to pretend to do the written down value at the end of the year for that class of assets or for that asset in question. So it is the end of the year figure that you're going to take 5% and compare that to the repairs and improvement figure to be able to then get the answer that you must get at the end of the day. So that is the answer to that, Ernestina. So that is the issue about standard tax planning and then also the issue about international tax double taxation. Then the other issue that I would want to quickly share my thoughts on is going to be the standard tax planning generally. There is going to be tax implication a lot in your exam hall for the advanced taxation students. So you have to be mindful of the various issues about the standard tax planning measures at the end of the day. Uh, and there are various issues that you must understand there. For instance, a foreigner who is seeking to trade in Ghana and is seeking to establish a permanent establishment or have an independent company. What are the tax implications? Seeking to come from a free zone enterprise as against a non-free zone enterprise. What are the tax implications? If you remember for free zones, maybe let me do a bit flex on that. If you remember the concept of free zone, what we mentioned is that the free zone enterprises can be 100% owned by residents and non-residents. Primarily, the free zone enterprises are supposed to export all their produce at the end of the day. However, the law requires that at least they can export 70% and sell at most 30% in Ghana. And what they sell at most 30% in Ghana shall include any production that they made, which does not meet the international market standard. Then they sell it in Ghana. The deal here is simple. The sales that they export will be taxed at 15% and what they sell locally will be taxed at 25%. However, for all the sales that they make domestically, they would have to make payment of VAT, NHIL, and all the import duties and things at the end of the day. But the sales in respect of their export they don't pay import duties, they don't pay VAT, they don't pay NHIL, they don't pay all those kind of useless taxes that you're going to be having at the end of the day on them. So that is the idea about that. So you have to be mindful. Now, the operations are not to be regulated by the Ghana Revenue Authority. However, the Ghana Revenue Authority is really going to be monitoring them to ensure that they are not selling in Ghana and saying that they sold the thing outside. Because remember the rule, domestic sales must be taxed at 25. Exports must be taxed at 15 generally, definitely after they are 10 year tax holiday because they have a 10 year concessory period of which they will pay 1% of their profits as tax at the end of the day. But after the 10 years, this is how the tax is gonna be applying. So GRA must monitor them to ensure that really what they said they are selling to the outsiders or they are exporting have been exported so they will tax at 15% because if not, quote unquote, 
they will say we have exported. They may have documents to improve that they have exported the thing, but they had sold it just in Ghana in order to pay a lower tax rate of 15 percent on the amounts at the end of the day. Then also dividend payments for free zone enterprises are going to be you know, exempted from tax as well in that case. So these are some of the issues that we must understand on the tax implication for free zone enterprises. So yes, it's beneficial to for the investor to go into free zone enterprises than a non-free zone uh, enterprise or investment, but the laws must be really understood in relation to how the operations will be done. So Tax implication for various forms and various types of businesses, we must understand. Another thing that I didn't bring under the capital allowance, which I mean, just dropped. Let me talk about it. If a company lease or buys an asset, what is the tax implication of that? Very simple. Capital allowance will be granted if the entity buys the asset outrightly, and that asset will be put into its class and capital allowance will be granted based on whatever percentage that we are using. However, when the entity leases the asset, the lease payment has two components. The capital element of the lease payment shall be granted as capital allowance, and the finance element of the lease payment shall be treated as allowable deduction. In principle, it means when we lease assets, all the annual lease payment will be allowable for tax purposes. But when we buy the assets, then we'll get a capital allowance based on whatever pool that that asset is in. But I want you to get the, the thin line between the lease part. You can just say, yes, it's allowable for tax purposes, but that will not excite the examiner. But if you contextualize it and say that, hey, the annual lease payment has two elements which you know already, the capital element and the finance element, and that capital allowance shall be granted in respect of the capital element. All of the capital elements will be allowable as, will be granted as capital allowance. Then the finance element will be an allowable deduction. That will excite the examiner better because that is how the law states it when it comes to dealing with the lease, or buying an asset as well. So when you lease it, the annual lease payment is allowable for tax purposes. When you buy it, you get a capital allowance. But the deal is that when you lease it, although the annual lease payment is allowable for tax purposes, you can break the elements up and then use the right terminologies per tax to excite the examiner at the end of the day. And that is really something that you need to be excited about in that particular case. So. That's the issue about that as well. Then we come to the OG. I'm going to have 20 mark question on petroleum and mining. Again, still in and, uh, advanced taxation students. We're going to be having a 20 mark question on, these, on this. And you have to be mindful. I think the types of revenues that governments get from these areas are issues that you need to talk about. Income tax. Mining and oil exploration companies pay income tax at a rate of 35%. That's default. That's organic. That's original there. Number two, we have the issue about, you know, carried interest, free equity that the government gets at the end of the day. Then we have the additional carried interest where government makes a uh, contribution to the development. Then we have the uh, additional carried or participating interest where governments make contribution to both uh, development and then production at the end of the day. So please make sure you read those things well and note the terminologies and whether government makes contribution or not contrib made, makes no contribution is very important. We have additional oil entitlement. This is a free oil that the government gets at the end of the day. If the expected required rate of return is exceeded, by the contractor as well. We have the profit oil, we have the sole risk, then we have surface rentals, which is also another organic issue that you need to understand. But when you are quoting the surface rental issues, it is important you, you're able to quote the rates applicable to the surface rental as well at the end of the day. So the revenues that the government receive from these guys, please make sure you really scan read them and get the understanding there. Then you come to the income of 
the tangible income of the mining and oil exploration companies. Remember, royalty is an allowable expenses generally at the end of the day for the mining and petroleum companies. And uh, it's at 5%. If the examiner is quiet, 5% on the gross production. It could be the gross revenue from the production, gross production. So if it is a mining company, the ounces of gold. All right. Or if it is a petroleum company, the barrels of oil that we produce, 5%. But the examiner sometimes is going to be really excited to mess up with you and he will give you a royalty rate because the royalty rate actually spans across between 7.5% to around 15%. And some can be over depending on the petroleum agreement. So sometimes in the question, the examiner will give you the royalty rate. If the examiner does that, just pick the rate that has been given and use that as your calculation. But if the examiner is quiet and we need to calculate the royalty, we're going to use 5% on the gross production of the entity. And that could be, like I said, number of barrels that we are producing at the end of the day or the ounces of gold that we have if it is a mining and oil exploration company. If we don't have the number, then we're going to deal with their gross revenue. Okay, they are gross revenue. Gross revenue is the revenue that is coming in from their production at the end of the day, and that is going to be paid out as royalties. Just like co uh, companies, the mining and oil exploration also will have the same allowable and non-allowable deductions, wages and salary and all that will be allowable for tax purposes. But note that, again, when we are dealing with tax planning issues and the uh, there is fresh graduates, then we have a fresh graduate incentive that you need to be mindful of. Up to 1%, you're going to get um, is it 30% of the wages and salary that you pay for the year as an additional allowance. Anything between 1% to 5%, we're going to be getting around, what, no, 10% and 30%, then I think 50% in that schedule. So make sure that you remind yourself of that as well, because that same allowance can be given to companies. If a mining oil exploration company is also employing fresh graduates, it's going to be applicable as well at the end of the day. So that is the deal about mining and oil exploration. Know the revenues that government uh, will have. Know the way we're going to be calculating royalties based on whatever context the examiner is going to be coming from. And then lastly, the, the way we determine the chargeable income of a mining and oil exploration company. Like I said, all capital expenditures are going to be disallowed and put into a pool so that capital allowance will be granted at 20% straight line or over a period of five years. Now, it then means that there are a couple of terminologies that you need to be mindful of when it comes to dealing with petroleum and mining operations. And uh, I'm not going to be in the position to be able to do that because there are terminologies because there are certain things that will be done in mining there are certain things that will be done in petroleum and they are part of the activities of the company and they, some of them are capital in nature which means they must be disallowed and some of them are traditional things in nature which means they will be allowed so you just have to be mindful of that and like i said whatever you do write the notes down to explain the basis for its allowable for, for it being treated as an allowable expenses or a non-allowable expenses. So that is the idea about the level three bits exclusively dealing with mining, standard tax planning, and then double taxation issues as well in that particular case. Then we come back to some arrangements in the level two and then which may also be crossed up in the level three, will be the issue about things like chargeable gains, okay, gift tax, capital gain tax. It's important you uh, read that well, especially for those of you in level two. There is definitely a question waiting for you on chargeable gain in the exam hall. The question is already smiling at you. Upeo, upeo, it's there for level two students, principles of taxation, chargeable gain is there. Either for gift tax or capital gain tax, it's going to be there. 10 marks if the examiner is excited, seven marks it has, if it doesn't like you, <laughs> then we're going to make it seven. But we're going to be having a question there. Most importantly, it's going to be the issue about the way we deal with gift taxes. Generally, all gifts must be subject to a withholding tax of, uh, or a tax of 
15%. You remember that already. But then gifts from close relatives like you know brothers sister nieces and cousins those are wife you know husband those are not going to be subject to the gift tax but then any other kind of gift will be subject to the gift tax however gift received by an employee in the course of the uh, activities will not be treated as a gift tax or in line with a gift tax instead that gift amount will be included in the chargeable income of the individual and tax at what the individual graduated tax rate. So when you go to a restaurant, you are saved, you love the service a lot, and then you tip the lady. That's a gift she has received, or uh, if, if say a, a he, that's a gift that he has received. That gift must be included in the chargeable income of that employee and tax at the individual graduated tax rate. So gift received during employment will be included in the chargeable income. When an entity also receives a gift, the same thing, the fair value of the gift will be determined and will be included in the chargeable income of the company and tax at the company's prevailing tax rate, which is gonna be 25% by default at the end of the day. So please be mindful of that. Tangible gain arises where the entity sells capital assets. It's important when you are calculating the cost base of the asset. The cost base of the asset is simply going to be the cost incurred up to the point that the asset is being sold. That's the cost base. But there is a caveat on that. If the entity incurs any capital cost, which is not there, as at the time of the disposal of the asset, that shall not be included in the cost base of the asset. Let me explain. Let's say we buy a land at whatever the heck, Kaswa or somewhere the heck, that we buy a land. Then we fenced the land and we spent, so we bought a land for, let's say, 50,000. Then we spent 20,000 Ghana cities to fence the land. Then after two years, we want to sell the land because we are, we are being harassed by land guards. And the Langards came and demolished all the fence that we have created, that we raised to protect the land. At the time that we are selling the land, the fence is no more. So that 20,000 Ghana city that we spent on fencing the land cannot be included in the cost base of the asset. That is something that you need to be mindful of. So in calculating the cost base of the asset, it is important you take into consideration any capital expenditure incurred, which is not there as at the time of the disposal of the asset, shall not be included in the cost base of the asset. So you compare that to the proceeds that we got, then that gives us the capital gain and it will be taxed at 15% as well. But remember, there is a rollover relief that is available. The reason is that for tax planning purposes, and that is how wealth is built generally. When an entity or, or when an individual or an entity or whatever it is sells a property and use the proceeds to acquire another property, then it means that the capital gain tax is going to be deferred into the future. And that's how the rich gets rich and the poor continue to get poor. Because you sell your land and go and use it to organize a wedding or birthday party. The GRA will come after you. You have to pay a capital gain tax on the, on the net amount that you got. But the wealthy will sell the property and go and buy another more expensive property. So what is happening is that they are pushing their taxes into the future. And that is the concept of rollover relief, where parts or all the proceeds from the disposal of the capital asset is used to acquire another capital asset in the same year of assessment keyword in the same year of assessment then there shall be what a rollover relief which means that there will be an exemption on that portion of the amount from the payment of the capital gain tax so please make sure that you are mindful of that as well as you get yourself into the exam hall and that is chargeable gains gift tax and his brother capital gain tax then for level two students whether i like it or not there's a question waiting for you on income tax liabilities of individuals or partnerships. The rule is pretty simple. You know the way we deal with individuals, you bring their basic salary, make sure you know how to calculate the basic salary if it is given in annual terms or if the scale approach is used. 
For instance, they would say that the salary is whatever, 5,000 times 2,000 minus 50,000. That's salary scale. 5,000 times 2,000 minus 50,000. The meaning of that is simple. It means in the first year of employment, you get 5,000. Every year, your salary will be increased by the second figure, 2,000 every year. Then when your salary hits 50,000, that becomes your salary for the rest of the period of uh, em employment with the company. So let me take that again. If we have a salary scale, 5,000 times 2,000 minus 50,000. The first figure is the starting salary for the employee. So in the first year, you get 5,000. The second figure, which is the multiplied by that second figure, is the annual increment that the employee gets. Minus the third figure is the maximum salary that the employee can get. So when you do the addition, the addition, and it hits that maximum, from there on, the person will earn that salary for the rest of their period, for the rest of the period of employment with the company. So if the salary scale is given, make sure you know how to calculate your basic salary for the given year of assessment. Because remember, for individuals, the year of assessment is January to December, but you're not always going to be getting it in that smooth round. You may have to do some proportion and ratios to uh, prorate the amount. So be mindful to calculate the salary for the period of assessment and the review if the scale is given. Alternatively, if the examiner wants to keep it sweet, simple, straight to the point, he could just give you the annual salary or heck, the monthly salary. And then boom, you go away in that particular case. So basic salary, be mindful of that. Then you're going to be adding various cash benefits that the person gets, all the cash benefits in the question, bring it. When you do that, you get total cash emoluments. Then you're going to bring in the non-cash benefits or benefits in kind. This is where you're going to have vehicle, you know, accommodation and those things. So make sure you remember the guiding principle on those reliefs. Okay, uh, I don't have them off head, but make sure you remember them very well because uh, accommodation, finish accommodation, there's a guideline for that. Accommodation only, there's a guidelines for that. Shared accommodation, there's a guideline for that. Vehicle with fuel with driver, guideline for that. Vehicle with fuel, there is a, a rate for that. Vehicle only, there is a rate for that. So make sure that you remember that because benefits in kind will come in there in that particular case. Then you get your total, you know, accessible income uh, for the period under review. Then you less your personal reliefs. So make sure you remember your personal relief. As far as the person is below the retirement age, the person will statutorily contribute to social security. So even if it is not stated in the question, as far as the person is in the employment of another person and is below the retirement age, the person would have to make contribution. So by default, 5.5% of the basic salary, boom, will be a personal relief that the person gets. However, if the person is above the retirement age, you don't make contribution for pension and hence, it doesn't come in the mix at all. So be mindful of that. If the examiner is excited and talks about the age of the person in the question, then you need to be mindful of. If the person is self-employed, please, self-employed, unless otherwise the person choose to pay pension, we don't bring SNIT or SSF 5.5 day. But if the person is not self-employed, but is in the employment of another entity and it's below the retirement age, 5.5% of the basic salary comes in there as the SSF relief. Number two, if the person is disabled, remember the person will get a disability allowance and that is 25% of total accessible income. That is income from employment or business. So be mindful of that. Again, that would depend on the context of the question. Three, if the person is married, then the person will get a marriage relief which is thousand two but if the person is not married but taking care of children okay maximum of two children i think so the person gets what we call responsibility relief and that is also going to be thousand two hundred now 
if the children, the person has children and the children are attending a school recognized by the Ghana Education Service, then there's a child education relief, which is 600 Ghana CD per child, a maximum of three. But like I said, the children should be in a school recognized by the Ghana Education Service. So if the children are schooling outside of Ghana, or you don't get that education relief. Then we have the um, aged dependent relief, thousand Ghana city, maximum of two people. I think so as well. You must know that. Then old age relief. So if the person is above the pension age, then the person and the person is still working, then the person gets what we call the old age relief, meaning the person himself is old, he's supposed to be working, supposed to be chilling and traveling around the world. But you know, the person is broke. So the person is still working. So the person gets an old age relief as well in that case. So make sure that you remember all of these things because you're not going to be given uh, that. But income tax liability is a done deal waiting for you in the exam hall. The question is actually smiling and waiting for you. Alternatively, we can have partnership. The deal about partnership is not anything different because in partnership, the partnership business is not subject to tax. Instead, the partners of the partnership business will be paying the tax. The partners of the partnership business will be responsible for the payment of tax. So at the end of the year, whatever profit that the partners, the partnership business makes, it will be shared between or among the partners in their profit sharing ratio. Note, if the partnership business makes a loss, losses are not shared, neither are losses carry forward under partnership business. Loss carry forward can only be enjoyed if the company is registered. So be mindful of that. Partnership business, if they made a loss, it ends there. Then once we share the profit, all other benefits that the partners receive will be included in the determination of their chargeable income, like some salaries that they got from the partnership business. It's an income. We're going to be bringing in in that case. And then any other benefit that they get will be brought. Then we will less any personal relief to be granted to them. Note, personal relief cannot be translated, cannot be shared. In other words, a partner doesn't have a, it's not married, it's not taking care of any child. Then he said, oh, let me transfer my responsibility of marriage relief to my partner. You don't do that. So it'll be specific to the partners and unless they are relieved, then we use the individual graduated tax rate to get their tax payable at the end of the day. So that's the deal on partnership. It's not different from dealing with the issue about uh, individuals. But if you are determining the profit for the partnership business, the same rule we use in corporate tax liabilities will apply. All the allowable expenses will be allowable. Capital allowance will be granted depreciation will be disallowed and all of those things that you know already about corporate tax liabilities will be applicable there as well in that particular case so that's about income tax liabilities of individual like i said level two principles of taxation that is breathing and waiting for you gorgeously in the exam hall 15 marks if the examiner is excited about it if he's not excited you could get it for 10 but it's still worth it whether it's individuals or that. For advanced taxation students, yes, you know that there will be something on level two in the exam hall, but we don't know where the heck it's going to come from. You just have to know the general principles as well. Then another key that thing that is going to stand out is the VAT administration. It's a very lengthy area, but it is important to understand VAT administration and then the concept of withholding taxes as well. There are calculations about VAT, calculation about the concept of withholding taxes when there is also VAT in the mix. So make sure you, you know, understand those very well to be able to then position yourself to generally pass the examination. But there is something on VAT that examiner is going to be throwing at you and withholding tax that examiner will throw at you in level two. So make sure you know about them. You know, types of supply, for example, supply, relief supply, exam supply, you know, know them very well. Uh, the criteria for registration of VAT, the consequences for not registering for VAT, group registration, you know, all of these things 
VAT is really lengthy, but the seminar is going to be throwing some 10 mark question to us on VAT and you got to know about it. Then the concept of withholding tax is also going to be very crucial and you have to know about it by default. Um, you have to know about goods, works, and services and the various withholding taxes that are applicable to it at the end of the day. Then the final thing still under income tax liabilities of individuals, I should have spoken about that there, is the treatment of overtime, bonuses, casual workers, and what else? Loan to employees. These four things. Make sure that he spends some time to know about them very well. I believe that everybody is having the basic principles document, which is available under the first video on the portal, whether you're in advanced taxation or principles of taxation. The basic principle document has a lot of information there that will help you that you can read through. I think it's about 62 page file. It has all the basic principles that you need to understand that will be applicable for you. So whether in principles of taxation or advanced taxation, you can make sure that you get your hands on that document and then you'll be able to use that as a guide. So know the way we deal with overtime. Know the way we deal with bonus. Know the way we deal with uh, casual workers and then know the way we deal with loans. Because if there's a loan from an employer to the employee, the loan will be at a concessory rate. In other words, while the central bank's borrowing rate is 20%, just an example, the company will lend the money to the employee at, say, 10%. The difference is a benefit that the employee is getting, and we have to add that benefit to the employee's accessible income for the year under review. And the calculation of that is the one-fourth of that benefit. And you must know the way that is calculated. And then even the condition around which that particular assessment must be made. So that is also something that we need to understand there. Then pension. Okay, there's a question on pension for you, level two again, principles of taxation, whether you like it or not. There is something about pension in the exam hall. You must know the roles of the National Pension Regulatory Authority, know the issue about the three tier uh, pension scheme of Ghana, the first tier, the second tier, the third tier, and how the various calculations are done there. Make sure you go through that because you have done it in class and make sure you understand that very well. Then the last thing is going to be the issue about um, tax administration in Ghana. There's a question waiting for you in the exam hall, both level two and level three. And it's a very lengthy or bulky area. Let me put it that way. It's a bit bulky area, but you got to make sure that you understand the various issues there. I mean, uh, the role of the GRA, the divisions of the GRA and the various roles that all of the divisions play in that case, then the issue about um, tax assessment, you know, we have the provisional assessment that is done by the GRA, self-assessment that is done by the taxpayer, and the various other conditions that we must understand. Because, for instance, if the individual self-assessment or if the self-assessment, the tax payable under the self-assessment is less than 90% of the actual tax paid, there has to be a penalty. So make sure you understand that very well. So if under your self-assessment, you say you're going to pay X amount of money, but then at the end of the year, you didn't do a media review. At the end of the year, you are paying more taxes, less than 90% of whatever tax that you claim to have been to pay under the provision, uh, under the self-assessment, the excess will be subject to a penalty. And that is usually going to be one 125% of the current borrowing rate or the policy rate of the central government at the end of the day. So make sure you understand that very well. However, under the provisional assessment, it is where the GRA is making the assessment or raising assessment and sending it to the taxpayer. And when the Commissioner General raises the assessment and send the notice of assessment, it's going to be including the name of the taxpayer, the tin of the taxpayer, the assessment raised, the payment schedule, how the assessment was raised, the time for payments, and then also any, um, how do we call it? Is it objection? how any objection can be raised. And when an individual receives a provisional assessment or a company receives a provisional assessment, an objection can be raised to that particular assessment from the GRA. And there are requirements for the 
tolerance of that because the Commissioner General of the Ghana Revenue Authority can only thorough, uh, tolerate any uh, uh, objection when one, the taxpayer has paid all outstanding taxes. In other words, he who come for equity must come with a clean hand. So the taxpayer must not have any outstanding taxes. That's condition number one. Condition number two, if the assessment raise is in respect of domestic income tax revenue, then at least 30% of the tax liability in the assessment should also have been paid. Okay, so number one, there shouldn't be any tax outstanding. You should pay all your taxes. Number two, if it is a tax in respect of domestic income tax revenue division of the GRA, then at least 30% of the tax liability raised in the assessment should be made before any objection will be tolerated. But if the tax assessment is raised in respect of imports duties, then the law says that all the taxes in the assessment must be paid 100% before GRA can tolerate any objections. And at the end of the day, if your objection succeeds and you have made the payments, you just get it as a tax credit or a tax refund because the money that GRA receives, not all of them will be paid directly into the consolidated fund. The law requires that they will keep at least like 10% or 5% of the total tax that has been received so that they will then make a refund to taxpayers when they raise objection or when there is uh, a realization that they have overpaid tax. So there are two options available. Either the taxpayer will say, oh, no P, give it to me as a tax credit next time when I'm coming to file my tax, so you write it off against me, or give me the money. Let me go chop the money because I've paid more taxes than I'm supposed to have paid in that particular case. So that is the issue about raising of objections and the tolerance level. Like I said, if it is about import duties issues, then one, pay all your taxes. Then two, you pay 100% of the provisional assessment by the GRA. That is the only point that the GRA will tolerate any objection and look into it for you. But if it is domestic tax revenue division, that means the assessment is relating to domestic tax revenue, then you have to pay all your taxes outstanding and at least 30% of the tax liability in the assessment that has been raised. So these are a couple of things that we must understand generally about taxation as we go into the exam hall in that particular case. And I think I'm gonna be wrapping up around here in relation to this. And I hope that I've been able to talk and uh, said a lot of things that will be valuable to you as you go into the example. My take for you generally will be, there's gonna be a couple of theories in the exam hall. And as always, you would want to take the written questions as fast as possible because most of the time, they're not gonna be requiring a lot of thinking into them because these are things that you have read and they could occur to you very easily. So during your 15 minutes reading time, you wanna scan, read the question, questions well, and then possibly start with the written ones that you can do best first in the very beginning of the exam. Then once you do that, you can then start with the calculation aspect. The key thing is that you're not there to impress the examiner. Nobody is interested in that. So you are there for free marks. You are there to get the easy marks. So always read the questions very well. Read all the questions. Take time to read all the questions very well and then ensure that you start with what you can do best first generally at the end of the day once you have that in place you should be able to position yourself to pass the examination and all of these principles will be playing out in the exam or at the end of the day the last thing that i didn't talk about i think so under advanced taxation is the issue about mergers acquisitions and transfers mergers acquisition and transfers, because that is also under tax planning that examiner control questions at. The basic principle under that is that uh, when there is a change in the underlying ownership of, an, of the assets of a company by more than 50%, then we say that the company has been disposed. 
So if it's a major arrangement, then two companies are coming together. So company A and company B. So let me say Etel Tigo, right? So this is just an example. That's not a reality. So let's say that Etel Tigo merged to become Etel and Tigo merged to become Etel Tigo. So let's say that Tigo owns 60% of the merge firm and Etel owns 40%. Now, at the date of the merger, what will be the tax position of Etel and the tax position of Tigo? So like I said, they merge. This is just an example to explain the principle. When they merge, Airtel has 60, Tigo has 40. So at the date of the merger or during the, at, at the point of the decision of the merger, what will be their tax position? Because Airtel has 60% in the underlying assets of the new merge firm, the shareholders of or the deal from the perspective of Airtel will not be seen as the company has been realized or disposed of. What it means is that any gain that will be made on the merger will not be subject to tax. And if Airtel was having any unrelieved losses, capital allowance carry forward, financial costs carry forward, and any other tax incentive, the merge firm can benefit from all of those things. Why? Because it is the same company that we are carrying on because they have 60% in the new firm. But Tigo having just 40%, will be seen as realized because the change in ownership is more than 50%. For that reason, any gain from the major arrangement of Tigo shares will be subject to tax. And if Tigo has any um, issue in relation to unrelieved losses, capital allowance carry forward, financial costs carry forward, the merge firm, Etel Tigo, cannot benefit from that. Why? Because from the perspective of Tigo, the company has been realized. So those benefits cannot be taken at the end of the day. So for tax planning purposes, at the time of merger, they can arrange the deal in such a way that if it is 50-50, then that is the a tiebreaker. For that reason, any gain made, either party will not be subject to the payment of tax. Whatever exchange, uh, carryover of losses, any tax incentive that, any either entity is having outstanding will be benefited by what the merge firm. So for tax planning purposes, at the arrangement of that merger, arrange, uh, at the arrangement of the merger, they will look at which entity will have more tax incentive and they will let that entity have a higher interest in the merge firm so that they can benefit from the tax incentive generally at the end of the day. And that is a tax planning issue that you need to understand. The same rule applies to transfers and the same rule applies to acquisitions as well at the end of the day. 50%, the change in the underlying assets of the company by 50% or more, that becomes the general rule at the end of the day. So, you know, these are the things that we need to understand. If there are no other questions, we're going to call it off. And uh, we wish you all the best as you go into the exam hall. And uh, like I said, take your time, read the questions well. There will be a couple of theory or written questions in the exam hall. Take them out as early as possible. Take them out as early as possible because you don't want to be on your way home or on your bed in the evening and you know so there is something that will happen to you after you finish writing the exam for some reason as you are going home or when you get home somebody will just tell you let me check this paper well only for you to see that there was a seven mark question a 10 mark question that you had read but you didn't see it because of the moment that you were in so like i said make sure you control your emotions make sure you are composed, stay calm, but most importantly, take time to read all the questions well. Then you start with what you can do best first. My take is take away all the written parts. When you do, that buys you some time and then you can then look at the other areas of the exam generally at the end of the day. So that is basically what you need to understand and make sure that you right? If it is income tax liabilities of individual, corporate tax liability, if the examiner says calculate the tax implication of something, 
Make sure that you write the name of the taxpayer. Make sure you write what the heck you are calculating and make sure you write the basis period because the examiner has said over and over again that students don't really mention or talk about this and that affects your mark, the mark allocation to the students as well at the end of the day. So take time, read through all the questions, start with the written part first, ensure that you are not answering two different questions or two separate questions on the same page. As far as you are answering the theories of separate questions on different pages, you're good. That's the goal. Then you can come in and then do the calculation aspect. And you should be able to go in there and pass the examination. So that is it about that. We wish you all the best as you go and uh, do yourself proud or make yourself proud. Let me put it that way at the end of the day. and. Uh, go in peace as well so that's it about that tomorrow god willing for the people who are writing psa on thursday we're going to be meeting uh on psa for that and i think also fm i guess if my memory serves me right let me see yeah fm so tomorrow we're going to be meeting for the people writing PSA and financial management as well to again walk through the syllables share our thoughts in that particular case. So all the best and we will see you tomorrow as we continue with our discussion.